Um, my name is David Talkman. I'm not Ted Cohen, uh, the advertised moderator uh, who could not join us from LA. Uh, but I'm uh, pinch hitting for him today. Um, we've got a great panel, and we're going to be talking about the merging of content with new technology. Um, uh, before we jump into introductions for the panel, I'll tell you that two seconds about myself. Um, I am in uh, the consulting business doing biz dev for various and sundry clients, having spent the last eight years at AOL running all of their entertainment business development for movie phone and music, celebrity and live. Uh, and before that, uh, I was a music lawyer uh, doing transactional stuff in the music business. Um, so that's me, David Talkman. Let's move on. Do you want to start? Sure. My name is Varun Rathavan. Um, you hear people talk about some cool stuff in terms of application. I represent the boring stuff, the company infrastructure, <laughs> infrastructure space. Uh, data communication is one of the world's largest ISPs. And uh, I used to run the data center business for them. Now I, uh, I manage a new vertical. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm Scott Kinsey. I'm currently the VP of Marketing at Issue. Um, I've been there for a few years now. I've been in sort of the brand and new media marketing space for quite a long time. Um, uh, most recently for, um, as a CMO at Baby Center, uh, which is a Johnson & Johnson brand based in San Francisco. Um, and I have done everything from, you know, Ancestry.com brand marketing to startup marketing. And uh, where I, oftentimes with a heavy focus on content and content marketing. So. Cool. I'm Bernie Davis. I uh, work for Smart News, uh, which is a mobile app. I've um, been doing that for about six months. My background is in audience and business development and all things related to digital marketing. And uh, Smart News is uh, a you know, technology company focused on mobile and machine learning. We use algorithms to predict what people would want to read and serve that up in our app. Uh, pretty new to the U.S. We reached a million users in three months after launching in October, so we're growing quickly. Very much focused on the handset. The company's been around for two years uh, in Japan, raised capital to expand globally. Um, and you know, our driving philosophy is to create a great app that will deliver news to people in a way that will allow us to compete for the, you know, the hearts and minds of the mobile consumer who are typically playing games and things like that on their phones and really trying to reconnect them with, uh, with quality content. So, Good afternoon, intrepid travelers. Thank you for being here. I think now that we've all gotten here, the question is, will we get home? But it's nice to spend an hour and 15 minutes with you. I'm Jennifer Perry. I am the Vice President of Worldwide Publishing at Sesame Workshop, which hopefully most of you know as the company behind Sesame Street. And hopefully you have all experienced Sesame Street in your own lives, yourselves, or with kids or grandchildren. And what you probably know about Sesame Street, it's the television show. We are a 45 year young, we like to say, uh, media company, but what we truly are, and a lot of people don't know this, is a nonprofit educational organization. And we have had to transform our content creation and our distribution drastically since we were founded in 1969 as a TV show, but even more so in the fi last five or six years. And one stat that I'll throw out for us all to think about, because again, I think you can all relate to Sesame Street as a TV show, is that although television is still the number one way that our audience of kids zero to eight, primarily two to four, uh, access Sesame Street, uh, we know that 63% of our audience first comes to Sesame Street through digital application, not through television. And that has grown from 52% last year. So just one stat to show how everything all of us are doing up here is changing and transforming. Uh, my background is as a content creator in education, in museums, and in educational publishing. Hi, my name is Caroline Gohn. I'm the founder and CEO of Levo. And Levo is a professional network that millennials are using to navigate their careers. So think of the intersection between learning content and professional networking, connecting. We are a living, breathing example of that coming to fruition for a new generation of people. So we're the largest professional network that people under the age of 35 are using. And we've just gone ahead and integrated content and networking. And it's just part of our DNA for these digital natives. So really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. 
Um, before we start talking, I mean, who are we talking with out here? Are you guys all content creators, content distributors, okay, um, advertisers who help pay the nut for content creation, <laughs> um, students? Okay. Well, we'll, we'll build the software to set that box. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so we need you. <laughs> We're talking to you then. Um, um, so the audience here, you know, you guys are in the know. Um, the audience who we are trying to serve this new content uh, and, and through new digital platforms um, is a very interesting, uh, is a very interesting quandary. Um, I think of myself uh, when I'm at home with my two sons who are 11 and 14. Um, and the concept of digital native versus digital convert. Even better, when we have in the same room my mom <laughs> and me and my kids and the, and the sort of the differences about how we think about content, how we can even imagine reaching content. Um, my 11-year-old will grab his mobile phone. That's how he does. My mom will grab the remote control for the television and doesn't even think about, what do you mean I can reach, I can see movies on my tablet? This is crazy. So the first kind of question I'd like to uh, put out there to the, to the gang, and, and maybe Jennifer, you wanna talk about this first, is the notion of digital native versus digital convert. And what are we doing in the space to make sure that those digital converts are coming along seamlessly and easily? <laughs> and what are we doing for the digital natives um, that's new and innovative? Sure. Uh, given that I work at Sesame Street, our primary audience, as I said, is preschoolers. So we're in this unique position of having to have most of our content created for children but having to reach them through their parents. Now that's, of course, what children's television has always done. That was the purpose behind Sesame Street, was to educate parents through their kids. But what we're finding is that these two and three-year-olds are digital natives, even if their parents aren't. So we have had to figure out very quickly, and in many different iterations, how to create content that a child can use on a tablet, on a phone uh, without any best practices out there yet about how do you swipe, where do, where do you put the buttons, everything like that. And what we have found, we do tons of focus group research with real kids, real families, is that we have the parent, I need to use you as an example, um, actually <laughs> swiping the kid's hand away from the device thinking that, oh no, you're not supposed to touch there, or I'm not sure what it's, it's going to happen if you, Mr. Two-Year-Old, touch there. So we have to educate parents that it's fine to touch all over the place and that they have to uh, experience and become more familiar with all these devices themselves. Now, having done this for five years, that uh, spectrum has their, their education for those parents has advanced greatly uh, but it's still we're still learning how to create content that meets the digital converts expectations the parent while meeting the needs and the desires of the digital native of the child my two-year-old was uh, playing around on the phone when I left this morning. I'm sorry, but he, he was watching the, the YouTube Kids app, but I will do better. That's great. Get We're part of the YouTube some Kids app. <laughs> <laughs> Get him on some of your apps. Mm -hmm. but, um, well, smart news, I, I, you're bringing up an interesting point around the usability um, and kind of, you know, new new form factors on, um, you know, mobile. Um, you know, smart news is trying to create something that, you know, can work for uh, a very broad audience. Um, you know, from a content perspective, you can see the likes of USA Today and Time Inc's properties alongside Vice and Vox Media and uh, Medium Upworthy and some of the sort of new, you know, digital native publishers. Uh, and from a usability perspective, really trying to create something that is just, you know, efficient, easy to use. And I mean, you kind of are, you have a whole nother set of expectations among consumers that things just work really fluidly and very easily. Um, and when you don't hit your marks, you really hear from it in the user comments. And um, so it's a, you know, it's a challenging thing. You're, you're trying to bring something great to people 
I remember, you know, worked at Condé Nast uh, years ago, and we did our first Android app for the, ep the very popular Epicurious app. And God forbid we left a back button uh, that was, a, you know, a usability standard on, on iOS for Apple in the Android version, and we just got destroyed in, in the user comments. We were bringing people a free app that had 30,000 great recipes in it, but just got hammered in, in the comments. So it's a funny anecdote around kind of the expectations that people have of you in the space, and they're given a voice, and they think of themselves very much as a community, uh, you know, depending on what device they're on, and so. Well, let me, can I ask you if, how much leeway do you have? Right, so I can imagine back when that first Epicurious app came out, um, you'd probably get those comments where people would stick around. In terms of today and the digital natives that we're probably trying to address, if you get it wrong, what's your lifespan? Do you have leeway to fix it and iterate and correct your mistakes, or are you toast? I have a perspective on that. So um, we've brutalized our users for two years. I mean, our registration process was terrible. They still registered. Um, and I'm being facetious, but people will tolerate the experimentation if you're transparent about the experimentation. And I think that's the real, that's the real shift in expectations. The brands that have trouble adjusting to digital natives are the brands that do not understand that the, the bar has risen for communication. It's just that simple. When you've grown up in a world where you, you've never known what it's like to not have access to the internet, which is the definition of a digital native, and millennials are the first digital native generation, you know, you can, you can basically figure out if something that someone is saying is true in five seconds or less. And so the expectation around you being upfront about the challenges that you're having and just being more communicative as a brand have completely shifted. So our perspective is that as long as you're proactive about that and you talk to your users and you share with them that, hey, this is being, you frame it correctly for them. Hey, this is a beta version of something. The, the goal of us giving this to you is for you to tear it apart and we mm -hmm. accept and welcome that feedback versus this is a new version that incorporates some of the feedback that you had. Here are 10 specific users and their feedback and here's what we did about it. The more proactive and transparent that you can be about that, the more successful that you will be and you will have time to make those changes um, as a brand. I think the brands that try to launch something with the perceived arrogance of no conversation get, get shot down. And that will continue to happen yeah. with digital natives. Yeah, you know, I, I'd say that, um, so in addition to sort of having this open, um, transparent dialogue, you know, between the consumer and your brand, at least in, in our business, what we found, and, and I, you know, we've, we've made our share of mistakes, you know, kind of on all the platforms, right? But um, what seems to matter for us is our ability to deliver the content that they're looking for. If we can continually deliver content that matters in the moment that matters to them in the place they want to have it, they're much more patient and or tolerant around mm -hmm. flaws with our app, for example. Um, um, if we don't deliver great content, like if they can't, if they don't, if we don't deliver what they came to find, it doesn't matter how good the app is, they hate me anyway, right? If the content's great, they're much more, much more patient in general, at least for us. And again, we're, you know, content distribution, distribution business, so. And I'll, I'll I'm, I'm sorry, I'll add that even for a legacy brand like Sesame Street, and, you know, we understand, you know, you start working at Sesame Workshop and you feel like you have this unearned halo above your head. You know, you go to a cocktail party, you say you work there. We have to earn that every day. You would think that people would be kind to us when we make mistakes. Oh, no, they love to tear down Sesame Street or any brand that um, has been there for a long time. Um, but like you say, if you communicate and empower and acknowledge their comments, we will have we will have correspondence. We will have actual conversation through the app comments where people are rating your app. And they will say things like, I'm giving you one star uh, because I fi couldn't figure out how the, how the audio button works. But if you fix that, I'm going to come back and give you four stars. Yeah. And if you then say in your comments, we heard you and we fixed the audio button, or usually, honestly, it's not broken, but you just have to direct them to the right place to, to do their settings, uh, they will come back and they'll say, great communication, great customer service, I'm changing this to four stars. Mm -hmm. You have to be dialed into the comments and also you know back channels on social media and just have to be watching everything all, all the time. Yeah. We were just drawing this distinction between the quality of the content and the quality of the app. Mm -hmm. right? and, and the point you made was if the quality of the content is really good, it doesn't matter. It matters less how, yeah. good, the, how good the app is. 
I just I have a slightly different view. I think the app uh, experience is a hygiene factor. So mm-hmm. you know your quality can be great, but if the app doesn't work uh, or it doesn't work as well, uh, your user is going to be yeah, uh, dissatisfied. If the content works, if, if that works well, the user are going to be satisfied. They're going to be satisfied if the content is good. So you know, so it, and that's the, the reason I'm saying that is we hear a lot from uh, you know rights owners and uh, and media companies who are our customers talking to us. And they tell us, you know what, our users have very little, uh, uh, you know, time for anything that doesn't work. So mm-hmm. anything that buffers, you know, they might be looking at a kitten being playing piano, but the buffering should not happen. You know, it should it should work as if you know it, it, the data center was right next to where they were sitting. Yeah. So you know, I, I just think that distinction. I, mean, I don't know if you no, see that as well. I think I, I I would agree with you. I would just my my comment was more in response to the fact that I think we get a little more. A little more leeway, right? So if we have if we have a if we have a ninety five percent great app and we have great content, we're okay, and they'll they'll continue to invest with us sure. until it's one hundred percent, right? Mm-hmm. If we have a ninety five percent great app but they can't get the content, right. then then it's over. Right. Yeah. I mean, that speaks to the intersection though of the purpose of the discussion of this panel, which is the marriage of content and technology and content. To your point, it does create a patience factor and it creates a brand involvement and an emotional factor that gives you more patience with than with just pure technology because technology in isolation can be transactional until someone's invested something in it, right? So even for a network, until you have seven connections, depending on different networks, it's a different number, but typically until you have six or seven connections, you're not emotionally invested in the brand and you're not gonna start to be patient in the same way uh, and then more connections you have and the more frequently you engage and the more relevant the recommendations the more the patience gets extended so content <coughs> becomes this really like beautiful tool that you can use to extend that patience and build it all comes back to uh, building the emotional relationship yeah. with the user um the and internet also, is no different than real life so it also depends on who the user holds responsible so if mm-hmm. you know yeah. if the content is not good the host <laughs> user is going to hold you're responsible, for that, right? <laughs> but if the if the app or the experience is not good, they might. You know, there are there are many things that, that could go wrong. They might think, well, I should never have used an Android phone, or you know, AD and T is not doing a great job, or whatever, right? So, uh, you know, because of the patience factor, they might just give you a free you know, free ride and not hold you responsible. And that's, that's a good point. you know, that's that's probably mm-hmm. a good thing. That's well, an that's an interesting point, and and you know, it made me think about this weekend with House of Cards being available. Um, I'm sure many of Man of Yes. Oh, I won't say the Butler did it. Um, <laughs> um, you know, many of us, you know, tuned in, right? And uh, and my Netflix was a little wonky, and it wouldn't load, and I started to like get a little hot under the collar. <laughs> and it's interesting because it points out the difference we talked about before, right? The the consumer facing uh, interface. The fact that I can easily put a push a button and enjoy <laughs> on my smart TV content that I absolutely love, versus infrastructure, mm-hmm. and the fact that in my neighborhood in Brooklyn we got a ton of people <laughs> all hogging the pipes. Um, I mean, is it is it uh, are we are we moving faster on the interface side and the and the content side? than we are on the infrastructure side to support those advances? No, absolutely, David. I think that's a good point. Uh, we are. I, I believe we are. Uh, if you look at stats of how much data center capacity there is globally and how much is being used, very little is being used for data center capacity. However, if you look at users uh, and their experience is actually getting worse. So the problem is that uh, you know what we are doing is not using the capacity that exists to serve the users better. You need an mm-hmm. entire ecosystem across video delivery, for example, uh, to ensure that you have a good you know, good experience on the video that comes in. And I think that uh, one of the biggest uh, issues for apps not succeeding is not the content. They, I think most of the people do a great job. They focus on the right user base. It's the technology around it. It's the fact that the delivery doesn't work. It's the fact that it is, it's not consistent. Uh, and you know, it's, it's the fact that when everybody wants to use it, when you get big and you become a blockbuster, that's the time when things stop working, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're, it's a problem of success. If you're a website that nobody wants to go to an app that nobody wants to download, right. 
content that nobody wants to work, watch that work very well. Yeah, I've, seen, I've heard that in the startup space. Like, we're so good, our app crashed. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> we're so good. <laughs> how can that possibly, like, to, our, to the point that has been made, like, how much leeway do you get? Like, how can that be a badge of honor, <laughs> your app crashed? But it sounds like it is infrastructure. One of the things that's so exciting about the, the world of mobile and new platforms is that you can actually solve for problems and deliver experiences to people that they never thought they were even going to have, right? I mean, how many of us thought we'd have an app that we could dial up and have a car come to our apartment yep. to pick us up and take us somewhere and, you, can do you that. know, in 10 minutes, <laughs> yeah, it's called Uber, you should try it out. Um, you know, one of the things Smart News tries to solve for, and again, it's sort of like trying to compete for mindshare among consumers way more upstream than even news apps, like we want to change people's behavior from playing games when they're on the go to staying connected with world events and the news and be entertained. So we make the, the app actually works if you're fully offline and having an offline reader mode where the content's cached within the app. So it's kind of like really trying to think ahead of the curve in terms of, you know, not only the consumer expectation as it exists today, but, you know, what are the things can you uh, deliver to delight people that they didn't know they have it. Then, of course, once you deliver it to them, they, they're entitled to have it and it has to work yeah. uh, amazingly well. So. Do you, do you see a lot of engagement of that offline reading content? I'm sorry for... We do, we do. I mean, you know, in cases where we do send traffic directly to publishers and we have sort of like a, you know, reader mode, it's a little bit of a stripped down version of the article. Um, people do favor the publisher's mobile websites when they mm -hmm. load quickly, and fortunately, publishers are now really all razor tuned into making their mobile sites very efficient because people right. just don't wait around. Not like the desktop days, yeah, you might wait for a page to load, not a mobile, like you're gone, right? Um, so the you know it's very efficient to have this you know reader view, um, and you know so we do see uh, you know it's it's in favor of the mobile websites and the publishers if you're online, mm -hmm. but if you're offline, it's kind of an indispensable feature that people yeah. really love you know we discovered that too we we had the privilege of being smart enough to launch our android app first and then our ios app later and one of the things we learned from android is that because people are consuming content that's traditionally you know viewed as magazine content on their mobile devices they have this expectation that they can take a piece of content that they have in print and then they can put it down and pick up their tablet or mm -hmm. their laptop and have the same experience and then the same experience on their mobile phone, depending, no matter what platform or device size you pick it, they want that sort of consistent experience. And for us, um, that's like a key focus is making sure that we're ubiquitous anywhere you go. And one of the things we learned is that people, you know, we have, you know, 22 or more million publications on our service, which means none of you will ever read all of our content. And in my opinion, it doesn't matter. What 22 million publications means is that we probably have the content that's going to matter to you, right? But it only matters to you if you can consume it. So, you know, people, I watch people get in airplanes. And uh, I saw a woman the other day who had like 11 different magazines on this flight to Europe. And uh, I thought, wow, like if she just had the app, she could just install all those in the, you know, offline reading list and consume them on the plane. So mm -hmm. that was a big, that was a big insight for us, which worked really well. I was just wondering how it was working for you. But. It does very well, and you know, certain users want it to be the default, which we're not going to do. We have a very publisher-friendly model. We want publishers to, you know, benefit from, uh, you know, the audience that we're aggregating, and you know, really play into their current business model, which yeah. is their traffic. Um, and in order to, you know, work with publishers, uh, my my job is is publisher development. So we actually give publishers the opportunity to insert their advertising into that as well. So they can kind of come and claim it as an extension of both their brand and their content, and also their current monetization, which for now is display, and hopefully over time, uh, you know, we'll be able to morph that into other things that are relevant to their advertising mix. So interesting. The um, the point that you made about a traditional print publisher creating content and then wanting that to seamlessly and easily morph into the digitized version. Mm -hmm. um, and when we think about digital natives, it made me think about like that sort of fundamental question, like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. And, um, and it made me think of the New York Times piece that happened last year. Um, you might have seen it, this amazing article on avalanches. Um, this interactive piece, uh, it had video, it had cool graphics. I spent like 45 minutes reading this thing and interacting with it. If it was a New York Times article in the paper, I would have been done in three minutes and right. I would have been off. Right. It, it, like, with respect to digital natives, uh, 
which comes first now? Is it the fact that you can make interactive, um, interesting, video-laden content and that's where you're going to go? Or is it about mm. taking what we know, print articles, photo galleries, you know, the vanity fairs of the world and digitizing them? Which, which way do we go and which leads uh, for the future? Mm. For a content creator like Sesame Street, they both come first, and I mean that. They're, and you know, we work with twenty-five print publishers, magazine publishers, and those that have embraced digital are are doing much better for us than those who haven't. We've had to do a lot of digital content creation in house because our print publishers were slow to join us. And being a brand that has built itself and has a mission still to be everywhere that a child is, which really means everywhere their parent is on whatever device and whatever platform their parent is, we had to start our own ebooks program uh, long before even our biggest publishers, who shall remain nameless, uh, didn't have an ebooks program. So internally, to answer your question directly, uh, we there is no first, second, or third. We're developing parallel lines of content simultaneously. We can actually produce um, many more um, print books uh, in a given period of time, which might seem very unusual for those of you who know print publishing and know how long it takes to make a book and have it made overseas and shipped back four months over the water, et cetera. Uh, but the resources involved in digital content creation for the, for the type of in-depth educational product that we do, it can take six to 10 months to make an app. Uh, but so there is for us we're there there are parallel lines of business mm -hmm. that we manage concurrently we don't we don't have that discussion about which we, should we do first it's it's interesting because we're not a we don't create content we create very little of our own content or the distribution platform the technology that allows um what's often considered to be a traditional publisher to deliver that content and we actually with our customers see it happening both ways we have we have print publishers who um, put all their effort and time and energy into creating the content, making sure that it's perfect in print form, and they actually don't know what to do with it if they're not going to distribute it in a traditional fashion digitally. So they want an easy way to digitize it and then distribute it. We have other publishers who design for both um, digital uh, consumption as well as and distribution as well as print. Um, and then we have others who actually start projects by creating a digital only version of the publication, try to build an audience so that they have some awareness before they go to print. So we have some who are trying to get off of print and only on digital and some who want to start digitally and then become a print publication. So, um, and you know, I expect that to change, you know, in the next three to five years dramatically, but in today's world, there's a lot of people in the publishing community still trying to figure out how to make sure that they're there for that audience. Mm -hmm. Um, really interesting. A use case for Smart News is quite a bit different in that we're trying to capture people's attention in shorter bursts of attention uh, several times a day. So you'd come back and it's engineered so that you get you know, push notifications three times a day. That would lead you back to the app. The app will refresh in the background so the content is fresh when you arrive there as updated. So, um, you know, all of that does add up to, and it's very exciting to see kind of the, you know, digital in general, like moving to more sort of time spent metrics. Uh, in Japan, we're a little bit more mature of a business after having been live there for two years. All of that does amount to quite a bit of time spent. We have Nielsen metrics that show the average user in Japan spends about, you know, four and a half hours a month with it.
easiest. <laughs> when they're commuting, it's 95% of everything that's happening on the site during commuting hours becomes mobile. And then it goes silent because they sleep for a bit. And then the same pattern happens over and over again. So because our content is focused on your professional life and your career, it is following the user where they are in their professional life and their career in a very similar way that you just mentioned that you want your content to follow the parent, wherever the parent happens to be, um, and make that as easy as possible for them to access. So this, the short answer to your question from my perspective is it really depends on the nature of the content and who you're serving and figure out where they are and how to get into the closest screen. Anybody else have some thoughts on mobile, that? Mobile for Sesame, as I mentioned in that stat at the, at the beginning, is, is a huge, huge part of our reach. Thanks to our amazing 45-year young also broadcast partner, PBS, we're on television twice a day. That's it. You can watch us for an hour in the morning or a half hour in the afternoon. And we're very proud of that, and it's great. So most people are experiencing us throughout the day on mobile. That includes our apps, that includes our website, and that includes all of our social media platforms. If you haven't seen um, Elmo's uh, Twitter page or Facebook page, you might want to take a look. It's kind of fun. And what we're finding is that we are bringing different generations back to the brand through mobile. So for instance, uh, we have a series of viral videos. Some of you uh, may have seen our um, Carly Rae Jepsen parody, where it's just Cookie Monster talking about sharing. It's called Share It Maybe. Uh, we have a Grover Old Spice commercial. We just did a Birdman parody with Big Bird. Uh, these have humongous views, and this is all through mobile. In fact, uh, we are the biggest kids brand on YouTube. We are one of the biggest brands on YouTube, and YouTube is an absolutely huge part of our reach. It is second only to PBS in, in how we engage people. So it's mobile, it's social, and it's distributed everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's a tall order for you know, whatever's around you. <laughs> Wherever, whatever distribution platform exists, we try to, we try to be there. Well, for Smart News, certainly, we think kind of the handset is, is king, obviously. Like the app works on, on tablets, and we love that it, you know, it works very fluidly on, on tablets as well, but we're really trying to solve for you know, users on the handset. And I think you know, beyond the smart news, it's, it's pretty exciting to see um, you know, new desk, like mobile first platforms becoming destinations for content, like what's happening with Snapchat Discover and with Facebook really kind of you know, focusing now on driving more video consumption. Uh, you know, I think you know, I'm not working for a publisher, but I hope these are you know, fairly exciting times, if not you know, sometimes hand-wringing times for you know the way um you know kind of social and mobile seem to be sort of uh synonymous right at this point so many people are you know consuming content in these you know hybrid environments of both mobile and social um and you know snapchat's metrics i'm sure show that uh you know content is resonating and uh you know and they're you know these brands are now introducing themselves to a new generation of consumer to you know the point of the question was is you know is desktop dead uh is mobile you know First now, well, I'd say it very much is, especially for, you know, the next, you know, generation of consumer that's coming up, mm -hmm. but desktop still has its place for sure, and it's pretty interesting to see now, you know, once we've got some of these things solved, something like the, you know, wearables and watches will come out just mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. make, make things even more interesting, how people are going to interact with those, right? Yeah, um, that's an interesting point, um, and, and, uh, and, and when Jennifer talked about um, PBS, uh, and PBS uh, and and having that window of time, um, it made me think of like other content you find on PBS, like Downton Abbey. Um, some of this content that we're talking about is pretty expensive to make. Um, so let's not forget about who's footing the bill here: advertisers. Um, and and I'm and I'm still struck by how in certain instances you have ubiquity, which was a word that was mentioned earlier, but in other instances, you are very focused on the concept of windowing con content. Um, if you want this content, tune in at appointed hour on appointed channel, suffer the ad, uh, <laughs> and then you get what you wanted. In other instances, you want it on demand in your hand. 
Um, is this also a function not just of the consumer we're trying to reach, but who's paying the bills? I think it's also, it, it's, I have a like, very religious perspective on this in terms of society is degrading and we no longer have institutionalized religion and instead, so we don't feel like we're part of communities in the same way. So I'm not going to provoke everybody in this conversation. <laughs> Happy to provoke you later. But just think about it, right? 50 years ago, your parents probably went to a place every weekend, depending on your denomination, could be a different shape building. But many of your parents probably went to the same place every weekend to meet with a community of people and talk about a lot of the same things, share their values, feel like they were part of something, and then they went home. We don't do that anymore. Right. And so the Internet is now where people create the meaningful relationships that they feel like they want to have in order to belong. And so in my perspective, that's why you see this duplicity between I want this when I want it because I'm so excited and I get to control everything now. And I love cereal because cereal forces me to listen to this podcast whenever it comes out and I'm not allowed to binge listen to it. Um, and I feel like I'm part of something because I get to talk to all the other people who just found out whether or not Adnan is guilty. And we can also talk about that later. Um, and if you have not listened to Serial people, please go listen to Serial. It's amazing. Um, but you see these religious, religious cults being built around this, these specific types of content that are very strict about when they're released, what format they're released, and when you can and cannot touch them. And so people get confused, like, wait a minute, do you want everything when you want it? You want to binge watch House of Cards? Or do you want us to tell you what um, we want you to do and when? And part of it is that like, we, we feel alone, um, given the way that institutions are changing in our society. And so content gives us a way to commune around something um, sometimes. And we have like limited patience for it. We're not going to do that all the time. Um, but we're also human, and so we, we also want, for the rest of the time, and the majority of the time, to be able to control our environment. Also, the other, <clears throat> other dimension to that is uh, that engagement is expensive, right? So, I was talking to someone, uh, Game of Thrones has a, has a very so nice expensive. Uh, you know, online, uh, online uh, experience where you can go watch the show, figure out what's happening with each of the characters for people like me who have not read the book. Uh, uh, you know, it's important to know because it's, it's, a, it's a very intricate word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that engagement is expensive. You can't do that for every bit of content because uh, users are only paying this much for content, right? And advertisers, whoever, right? That's right. And then you have this entire another track of activity that you're doing that writes on that original content. It's almost like writing another show that you're mm -hmm. doing that with. Uh, to create that religious experience. So uh, I think it's also, a, uh, you know, a function of what content gets what format depends on what the willingness to pay is. Is it really premium content? That means there'll be a lot of, uh, you know, work put mm -hmm. in to, to make it even more, uh, you know, accessible, even more usable because you have so much at risk because you've spent so much money building this premium content. You can't, uh, you know, you can't allow for people not to have engagement with, with that. However, yeah. you might not do that with everything else. You know, as with all of this, something will get lucky and some formats will just succeed and we won't know. We'll talk about it later like this and, and you know, sort of come up with reasons why that was successful. But that's my, that's my view on, mm -hmm. on where the content engagement will happen. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting, um, the point um, that Caroline makes about community, um, which I think dovetailed a, a bit with what um, Scott was saying about uh, social. Right, because not only did those that other generation meet at that building every week, well now you can activate your social graph mm -hmm. and you can meet your friends at that place and have that community and share that experience with them virtually. Um, but the point about uh, um, the strict windowing and, and content you know, made me think about one example um, you know, say, uh, say somebody is obsessed with, I don't know, the New York Giants, um, you have only one choice. <laughs> there is no ubiquity. <laughs> you are all forced to show up at a specific spot. And so when we talk about the sort of mobile and, and cutting of the cord, there are these examples that strike me uh, of, of very firm grasp on our attention uh, and, and, um, and fighting against that cutting of the cord. I mean, is, is, is there always going to be 
uh, those powers and, and will sports and other uh, uh, sort of event type uh, content always drive us to that big big screen in our living room? I think we're always going to have the duplicity between these two things unless we find an alternative to community because what we're seeing with digital natives, we're seeing it with millennials who are already active in the workforce so we better understand their behaviors. We're seeing it again with Gen Zers who are in high school, the first class of Gen Zs entering college this September, terrifying. And then we're seeing it with, I don't know, are we starting at A again after Z? I don't know, whatever the next generation <laughs> is, digital native children. The, the duplicity continues because fundamentally, we're trying to adapt our need as humans to be communal and to have repeatable systematic rituals um, to this new age of, of overwhelming content and self-direction, which is lonely. You're, when you're self-directing, you're a pilot by yourself most of the time. So sometimes you want to take a break and hang out with other people. Hmm. It's interesting question. to see. Question. Yeah, oh. oh, sorry. Yeah, you want to hit us with a question? I have a question about uh, how does gamification play into your next generation content strategies, especially when it comes to deepening engagement, because back to money, the mm -hmm. advertisers, I mean, it's one thing when everyone just shotguns content out there and you hope somebody just grabs some of it and then you say you have so many views and give me some money. That's I'm not paraphrasing the today's strategy, it feels that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you keep seeing the gamify, you, you, you grasp people or the smaller cult mm -hmm. of that people, um, which might have smaller demos, but much more intense demos and typically you have to go through the roof, right? I mean, in terms of cost and value. So I'm wondering, you know, how do you guys see gamification playing into your strategies in developing? I mean, obviously, uh, with the, the Sesame Street and stuff, you know, you guys kind of nailed that one for a while. <laughs> but, uh, but, but just others, you know, when it comes to. Well, I'll go first because, and then we'll let everybody else, because I think everyone would have very interesting perspectives on that. Uh, being an educational organization, what, what you call gamify, we might call something else, but I know exactly what you mean. And we do interactive layering and, and uh, our, we, I, the, the buzzword this morning seemed to me to be depth of engagement or the buzz phrase, right? And we're very much about creating depth of engagement and looking at how long people are spending on our <coughs> website, how long people are spending with our YouTube videos and definitely how long people are spending with these very expensive apps that we're developing. So it's a huge part of what we do to develop a loyal audience, not just a here and there audience. Mm -hmm. uh, we still want that, we still want those people who are only coming to see the viral videos that I referenced before, because that breeds a love of the brand, which in our history already has resulted in multi-generations of people being able to share something it, that that to your point that you know there aren't a lot of things that we all have in common and I'm very very lucky to work with a brand that most people have in common and most people like to share but the what you call the gamification is important to all of our content we're trying to create more interactive television we're definitely creating interactive apps enhanced ebooks we're creating Twitter conversations we're creating experiences for user-generated content. So all of that is to build depth around a loyal, engaged audience that is going to stick with us after they're four years old and come back to us as something that they love because of many different reasons, not just because it taught them uh, colors or shapes when they were four. So uh, for Smart News, we're not so much focused on gamification per se, or actually, you know, kind of trying to eliminate a lot of barriers to entry, um, whereby you don't even necessarily create an account with Smart News. You, you use the app, and we learn about you by employing machine learning to model who you are, to learn about and predict what you might like based on what we see happening across our network. Um, so from a, a user perspective, we don't have anything of that nature, but I can say, users have you know certain utility utilities that they want they want to be able to you know save articles and we integrate with pocket for that they want to be able to share articles so we're you know kind of more focused on uh, from uh, you know kind of toolkit perspective uh, certain features like that 
And then as a means to drive engagement, we're a little bit more focused on sort of discovery and serendipity. Um, you know, a, a lot of more highly personalized uh, apps that are out there or services that are out there are, are very interesting. Um, but, you know, there's kind of this uh, school of thought related to what is becoming known as the filter bubble where if things are overly personalized, you might miss things they didn't know that you were looking for. Um, so we're really trying to, you know, create an element. Smart news where you might come in for, you know, world news or technology news, but you might discover something, um, you know, through the serendipitous or sort of like surfacing of interesting content um, that comes from like the millions of people sharing things on social media and what's happening all over the web um, to create something that is going to delight you and you're going to discover it in addition to the thing that you're going to the app for. And that's kind of what's driving our current engagement metrics. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, an issue we have in the neighborhood of 100 million unique visitors a month globally, and that's actually not the metric that we focus on. What we really focus on are more engagement metrics that we care about return visitors and time spent and engagement much more than we care about the total number of uniques. And one of the ways um, we do that um, is by ensuring we deliver the right content. We do it very much the way you guys do. So we have a technology that deconstructs the content of every publication on issue and then understands um, by topic type what that publication is about. So if I'm reading a gardening publication, it can tell me that most of the content um, or most of the articles or most of the copy is discussing these five topics. And then it compares that to the rest of the content in our library and starts surfacing content that is similar to, but not exactly like the content that I'm already consuming. So the more I consume, the smarter we get. Um, and I think it's interesting that you point out that you also need to rely on serendipity because I think one of the, uh, it's just my belief about human nature, but I think it's, I think when we get fed too much content, that's too much like everything else we think we want to consume. Like when we get driven down a path, um, we enjoy that to an extent, but at some point you want to discover something new and fresh that you like was previously undiscovered. And so I think that's why it's also nice to be able to, you know, weave in that, um, the content that may be relevant or valuable. Um, cause we, so we can sort of delight the customer mm -hmm. with that new piece of content or new content type. Right. But, Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's interesting to think about social as another aspect also of finding that new thing that you didn't know about because you tend to trust your friends who tell you, hey, did you see this cool New York Times article or did you see this Game of Thrones app or did you see this cool game, whatever it might be. Um, and it's interesting too that it's all about engagement of the consumer and the user, but there's so many darn choices out there. I mean, how many zillion cable channels do I have? How much flood of content is there on YouTube? Um, we got Netflix zapping at us. Now I've got Sonos in the house so I can listen to a hundred thousand different radio stations. Um, the metric of, 100 million UVs versus the time spent with respect to each one of those mm -hmm. individuals. Um, one thing we, ha we haven't talked a ton about is curation. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how is technology moving forward to help us cut through all that clutter? Um, you know, I know YouTube has talked about how they are trying to track and understand your behavior to give you stuff that they think that you might like. And we know that Pandora tries to do that when it comes to music. They don't always get it right, but they always, uh, but they try. Um, <laughs> do, do, what do you guys think about in terms of curation and, and, and how we can sort of ensure engagement by serving up the right kind of content to the user. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I sort of covered that briefly just a second ago, right? But I think it's, um, I'm trying to think of another way, another way to describe this. One of the things I like to tell um, publishers is that we, what we deliver is a curated audience of readers. I mean, we understand what they want to read or consume because of their behavior and we can, you know, almost instantaneously like curate a collection of either perfect content for the consumer, but also package up a set of consumers for the publisher or by extension, the advertiser. Right. Right. And, um, but is there, is, does there need to be a human touch there? 
does there need to be a uh, yeah. or can an algorithm just take care of it all for no, you? No, I I believe personally that there needs to be human touch. I would actually say that's that's one of the things I think makes Sesame work really well. Is it always feels human and approachable, um, and I think that's because they perfectly understand who their audience is, which is the kindergartner and all of us. But um, in, in, in our business, <laughs> in our business, we have, like I said, we have we have we have a technology that makes all those connections for you, right? Mm -hmm. But then we actually still have um, we still have an editor and a team of people mm -hmm. who somewhat mm -hmm. regularly sort through the best and brightest of the newest content to make sure that we're showing you something new, so that your experience isn't just, you know we're not forcing you down a pipe that we built with our technology on the back end because at some point we're going to lose it because there's no human interest or connection right like we have to content is meaningful to people um across like a vast number of dimensions personally that we don't think we even always generally identify it's one of the things that's interesting about our business is that um, there are a lot of consumers who like um refuse to believe that there'll ever be a time when they won't hold a print magazine right mm -hmm. print magazines which is essentially what we deliver this year are very snackable, right? Um, it's a, it's a perfectly encapsulated little story about a specific thing, surfing or gardening or, you know, or, or cars, right. Or, or just specifically Ford cars or just Ford Mustangs or you pick it, right. Mm -hmm. um, but I can pick it up, consume a piece, consume the whole thing cover to cover, um, just browse the ads, just browse the photos. I can put it back down. I can pick it up again. I can fold it up and stick it in my pocket and try it again later. Um, and that's one of the things that, that's that's an engagement type that we've discovered at issue is like very very valuable to consumers as they'll they'll find a piece of content they'll open it or they'll put it in a stack to read it later which is the equivalent of sticking their coffee table um, and then they'll go back to that same publication three or four times we've also discovered um, that a lot of the consumers that are reading our type of content we tend to want to vilify advertising a little bit but they actually read it for the ads in a lot of cases like there are a lot of consumers um, and we can see this in our metrics and because of the way our social sharing tools work. We have a we have a product called Clip, which allows you to essentially select any atomized piece of content in a print publication, which is now digital, and then share that to your social network, right? Mm -hmm. But by doing that, we I get a chance to see what people are actually clipping, right? Yeah, yeah. And they're clipping stuff Sorry, like yeah, it's like, oh look, I love Brad Pitt's eyes, and that's <laughs> great. But a lot of times, people clip <laughs> ads and like will actually post an ad um, to like their Pinterest board or to their mm -hmm. Facebook page, and, you know, because that's actually valuable content to them, and it's actually advertising. <laughs> right? that's interesting. I think um, Smart News perspective is, you know, we're kind of fully algorithmic in a way in that, you know, our, we have channels that the, the you know, the algorithm that selects content that you should read based <laughs> on what everyone's reading, what is being socialized on the web. Uh, but we do curate in that we present, you know, different publishers that you can go and they have their own channels. And, um, you know, so we do some human curation in that we work directly with, you know, premium publishers and give them more of a presence on the app. But what I, you know, what I think is, is interesting, it's not like a one size fits all sort of thing. I think, you know, devices present opportunity to push content that's relevant to you in different ways. Um, I mean, just think about, um, you see Google now is something that Google's you know, running at where they're trying to figure out like what's the most important email you have to read. What's the most important thing in your calendar? Can they push the weather to you? And that's kind of like on your home screen. And then obviously you want to go deeper into any one of those apps uh, for a fuller experience. And we're a partner uh, with Google now. So you'd see smart news updates coming into that. Uh, so there's, you know, I think machine learning and, and the future of data science will help people stay informed. And then as you see more wearables coming, maybe there's an element of that where it's your fitness, uh, you know, updates are coming to you. And maybe if you have the you know Apple phone and the and the iPhone, I mean the Apple Watch and the phone, you know certain elements of uh, you know that curation will bubble up to you, but certain elements will only make it to your watch and what's relevant for that device. So you know, it's 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 getting more and more complicated. But I think you know the, our perspective is that like machine learning and data science will be the future of a lot of highly relevant startups that have all have their genesis in like what you know uh, Amazon's recommendations to you and. Uh, I think Netflix yeah, does these too, but actually as much of a fan as I am in Netflix, I think the recommendations stink, but uh, <laughs> that's my own personal <laughs> belief. But, um, so, yeah, so. Well, that's one of the points I think that's really interesting about machine learning is that um, my, my belief personally, we use 
machine learning to drive personalizations because in the context of your career, as you go through each stage, you're a starter, now you're a transitioner, now you're an integrator, you want to learn the next thing, you want to be connected to the next person, you want to only see job opportunities that are relevant to you only when you're looking. So machine learning is really important, but there needs to be a human element of curation. We also have an editorial team who does things like round up the best of what we do and create some of the content that is the most important or temple. Um, and that actually feeds our design of the way that we're serving up um, what the machine is learning, right? So humans have to design the algorithm. And at the end of the day, the more information that we have on what's being presented, the better. And one of the dangers that we're seeing in the space with a lot of startups like jumping on machine learning, um, you know, with their eyes closed, is that you have to be careful because Again, let's go back to basic human principles. People want to have a conversation. If you have an obnoxious machine learning system, <laughs> then that is like you having a conversation with someone where you start to speak and they say, no, 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 I already know what you want. No, 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 you wanted to wear the red sweater and you want to eat a salad for lunch. And I know that you hate the <coughs> snow and you, all you're wishing for is the sunshine. And you just kind of like, be quiet. I know what I want. I would like for us to have more of a conversation. So you have to be careful about the push in the pool. You can't just push, 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 push. It's the same level of, of obnoxious as if a person was doing that. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be push and pull. And you, you need to have humans kind of stepping in sometimes and making sure that the quality of the conversation is the right conversation, that people are happy, that they're comfortable. So the, the same basic principles that you would use if you were hosting a party and you saw you know, your obnoxious pusher friend sit down next to your sensitive, um, creative type friend and you're like, Ooh, we need to pull this person away sometimes. Um, those, those principles apply here. Mm -hmm. I and, just want, yeah. We also have actual human beings that train our algorithm, uh, not cyborgs. So there are people with editorial dollars. backgrounds. And I, I was yeah. curious that I wanted to ask you, so what do you do to enable that feedback loop? Uh, is there an element like passive personalization? Like, give me a little yeah. more of this, a little less of that. Exactly. Like, what do you what do you guys do to solve for that? Well, I think there's there's two layers. So you know, there there's first of all the explicit data that the user will give you, and in our context, I'll give you a specific example. <laughs> um, and then there's the implicit data that the user will give you. So we're we're very focused on careers. So I'll bring that up. You might say to me explicitly. I'm not looking for a job right now. I am not a transitioner. I am happy where I am. And that's what you're explicitly telling me. And then you keep reading articles about how to navigate burnout and how to deal with a toxic coworker <laughs> and how to know that you're so unhappy at work. And am I unhappy or am I just a millennial? And all of a sudden you go, mm, I think you are looking for a job. And your implicit and your explicit data actually contradict each other. And so it's that as one part of this. And the second piece is, the push and the pull are really important. So it's like, okay, well, what are the first really easy things that you can get someone to do and show them, right, that you're listening. And then, you know, when, depending on your platform, is the right time to come back to them and say, hey, you know, if you click on this tile or if you participate in this atom of content, then you'll get to take this self-assessment and you'll learn in the same way as your friend Jason just learned what kind of career track you were born to be in. And are you a Napoleon or a, I don't know, I can't, I can't think of another one. The point is that <laughs> the push and the pull can be organic and it can happen over the course of the experience with your user and that, that flow, that cadence of conversation depends on what you're trying to accomplish. It depends on the content. It's the, it's the beauty of all of this really. Jennifer, you had something. I, I just want to say something very quickly about curation, similar to some of what my colleagues have said, but also maybe a little bit different. This is a cliche, but sometimes less is more. And what we are finding, and this has been a hard lesson for us, is that uh, even though we have an ebook store that has 180 ebooks for a really great monthly price, how many people really need 180 Sesame Street ebooks? And I curated it, and I'm the one saying that. <laughs> um, so, uh, what we've learned is uh, when the Amazons and the iBooks came to us and said, We want every digital file of a book that you have, and you must have a lot of them because you've been doing books for 45 years. And yes, we have thousands of them. I knew enough to say, you know, that's not, I don't think that that's what our consumer really wants. And, you know, four years after we've done it, we have somewhere around 60 ebooks available for direct distribution. This is separate from the, the ebook store app I just talked about. And do you know that my top 10? In addition, we are about to start um, 
a rest and retirement program for our apps. <laughs> some will retire forever, shh, don't tell them. And some of them, some of them are just gonna go into, you know, go take a vacation for a little while. Because we need to help our consumer, we need to help curate what yeah. we now know after having put all these apps out there for five years, are not only what we feel the best learning experiences, which is truly where we start with everything at Sesame, but what our users most engaged with. And we know enough now. And sometimes it's hard after you've put a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of sweat into something to say, I actually think I need to turn it off and take it down. So this is a, a rambling way of saying where I started that sometimes less is more and we're about to very consciously begin a less is more strategy at Sesame in our digital space. How many apps do you have? It's a tough question to answer, but in the US English language, there's somewhere around 45 or 50. Uh, that's a lot for a two to four year old and for his or her parent to choose from. Um, one other concrete example, you mentioned the YouTube app. Uh, I told you how big we are, 1.4 billion views on YouTube. Our, ten, our, our top videos all have more than 10 million views. I mean, we're a huge player on YouTube. And we're, we've been very satisfied, incredibly happy with our YouTube experience. And then we became part of the YouTube app last week. And wouldn't you know it that our, our YouTube views went up 24% with a smaller curated collection versus what's just available by search on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, doesn't that speak to your community? You were saying you're a community already. People know generationally, you know, I got that, you know, Red yes. Dog book, and then your kids mm -hmm. get the Red Dog book. And that's yes, I can't deny. <laughs> Yes. However, I will say that even if you're a brand like Disney or Sesame Street or Dora, uh, not everything you put out there works. You, we, uh, we've been surprised on both ends. We've been surprised at things that we've spent years on and launch and are just so disappointing in terms of both sales and engagement. And then we've been surprised when we decided to do something two weeks ago and made it happen really quickly that, you know, there are 1.3 million views. So um, we're still trying to figure that out. But yes, of course, we're very lucky to have built-in engagement. So like a startup, right? Have experiments <laughs> we're both. that we're, out there. We're, and the exactly. We're, and you know what we always say at Sesame, and I'm sure all of you, especially startups, say this. Um, what our CEO says every year is, remember, we're still an experiment. That's how we started, and that's what the future is for us. Smart News is actually a pivot. It was a personalized desktop newsreader in its first iteration before it was Smart News, and uh, nobody cared. So, <laughs> co-founders went back to back to uh, the drawing board, and uh, Smart News is born. So, did anyone bother to tweet, "Am I unhappy or am I just a millennial?" Because I thought that was <laughs> very important question. Yeah. Varun, did you have one thing to add? No, I, I, you know, you started off saying that there's a problem with too much content yeah. and curation could solve it. There could also be a problem with too many platforms that do curation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and if you're not there yet, maybe, um, mm -hmm. but we will hit that barrier pretty soon. So then you have the next level of uh, abstraction, which is curation of curation. <laughs> uh, and where does that end? <laughs> oh, we, will, we will end up hitting uh, the natural uh, you know, amount of time that people have. To, to engage with content and there's only so much you can do so I, I completely agree with less is more i mean uh, i think for the entire industry maybe less is more because every new curation platform that adds or any new platform that's coming in mm -hmm. it's actually slightly destroying value for all the other platforms that exist mm -hmm. uh you know unless there's one thing that comes up which which becomes so successful that everything else sort mm -hmm. of uh, you know too. becomes obsolete and that's the hope that every new curation platform comes in with so that's just a point yeah, good, good. Yeah, I saw a question. Yeah, um, in the cable industry, regardless of how many channels get launched, it looks like each of us have about eight channels that we want. My eight might be different than yours, but you know, whether it was 200 or 500 channels, we tend to all the research seems to show at this point. And I'm wondering what your observation is in mobile. An app is sort of like a channel, if you buy that idea. And I'm just wondering what each of your observations are about how many of the many apps you've downloaded and probably ever go back to? How many apps are you finding that people use on a somewhat regular basis, like in cable, you seem to only go to about eight channels? Mm -hmm. I just wonder what numbers mm -hmm. you're seeing and what the trend is. Do you want to take that, Gina? I mean, we're seeing like three. Yeah. Wow. It's like yeah. after three, it's just no, I can't deal with yes. this. Okay. 
Yeah, the, re um, the research that I had seen, um, I guess last year at AOL, we did some work on you know, movie phone and stylus yeah. and like, and all the apps that we're building. Um, it was five. Yeah. It was five was the, was the typical average number of apps that people regularly utilized in, and, and it made a difference to their lives, whether it was content or utility. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. generally the number, despite the fact that we all typically have like 25 loaded onto our devices. Yeah. And does everyone agree with that? The numbers, I, you're surprising me. I didn't realize the numbers were that small. I thought you were going to say eight. Hmm. <laughs> Sesame's a little higher, but, but it's logical that it would be because if you have a child who's going through potty training right now, you launch that app, right? Um, right? And please do, because it will help, except the songs might drive you a little nutty. Uh, but given, given, that we, <laughs> given that we have very different curriculum subjects, it's a little higher for us, because if you have a kid who needs math skills versus ABC school skills uh, versus a great storybook app, so we're seeing very high engagement for about 10 of those 45 apps that I alluded to. For an app like Smart News, and we sort of live and die by our, our daily active user rate, uh, you know, so, and we have 10 million downloads globally, uh, but the daily active user rate is really the, the key metric, how often are people coming back, and, you know, that we know that we recognize there's a lot of app abandonment out there, um, you know, really trying to be one of those apps that people use on, on a daily basis, and uh, yeah, seeing from 25 to 30 percent. Yeah, what percentage in general? Uh, daily active, typically 25, 30%. Um, monthly basis, it goes way up, you know, above 50%. So. Well, I think just to clarify as well on your point, there's a difference between what's referred to as like an omnibus app and what's referred to as like a single purpose app. Mm -hmm. So for example, if your child is potty training, that's a single purpose app. Right. There's a transitional phase. You need an app to help you transact a specific <laughs> thing. And when you're done, you, you're quitting. You're done, right? Your child is now happily learning to do other things. Um, versus an omnibus app is a Pull lifestyle ups. companion. Um, and so an omnibus app is something that, that you want to be um, if you're in the app, like if you're if the purpose of your company is to build an app because you want to be the companion to the person who's using the app each and every day. And so it needs to be more than just a transactional thing that they're going to use for one phase of their lives. And it's okay. You just have to be honest when you're building your product as to which one you're trying to serve and what the content is that you're going to put in either because it varies. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because even at Sesame, we've just built what you're calling an omnibus app so that for the person who just wants, they don't know what they want, but they mm -hmm. just like the brand, right? Their mm -hmm. kid likes Sesame Street. And so we have just built Sesame Street Go, which right now only has video and games, but it's our goal to make it a portal for Sesame. It doesn't mean that we're getting rid of individual apps that you can find for mm -hmm. the very purposes that she just outlined so well. Uh, but this is gonna be that main portal where you can pretty much get a taste of anything Sesame Street. And we'll, it's a very new business strategy for us, and we'll, we'll see what kind of engagement we have there versus in the individual apps that you have very carefully selected for yourself at that moment in time. So just to want to hit the pause button for one quick second, are there any, with us getting to the end here, any questions um, over here? So I wanted to tie together a few things that some of you had said. One was this idea of serendipity. And the best definition I ever heard of serendipity was unexpected relevance. Mm -hmm. So then when we talk about machines versus humans, um, it seems like machines are very good at the relevance part of it, mm -hmm. figuring out exactly what's relevant. But the unexpected has to go into that human piece of it. And so with the Sesame, those viral videos, right. like, that was a great example of unexpected relevance. Like, Big Bird was like, oh, I get it. And as an adult, I get it as a kid. Um, but the same thing when, you know, oh, I didn't know I was searching for a job, but I really am. Really? And so I guess I'm just wondering if that's the time that you see for the future, like just really figuring out where that point of unexpected relevance is. For smart news, it's, it's you know partly uh, a function of having a user experience that caters to that and having something that's fun to utilize and easy to explore. 
Um, so, you know, while the machine learning and the algorithm will determine a lot of the content that goes into it, having something that's fun and entertaining and highly usable, that you get people moving around to different parts of the app that showcase different parts of the content is also kind of a key component. So it's partly just the, the user experience you're able to deliver that will foster that discovery and have people moving around. That helps answer the question. Besides, it's like <laughs> gamification, like yeah. you were talking about, is like this. Oh, wow! I didn't know that I. Yeah, it's, su it's surprise and delight nice. of the machine yeah, learning. But that's the hardest part. I mean, if we get to a point where our we're good enough that the patterns that we create to predict what our users want to see next surprise and delight them beyond what um, you know the the linear equation would define. I mean, that's like the holy grail of getting to good design. That's really hard. And I think we're still a few years away from that. Any other questions? Sure. Quick question. How much are you finding your brand, if it's a magazine, if it's a album, if it's a special career specialist, you know, are as important or more important than your underlying platform? And then when you decide <laughs> to kind of allow that piece kind of overtake. I have like a very simple example is a show which like you probably don't hear watches a uh, uh, Fred Zakaria uh, on CNN. And they built this kind of cool site for him, I don't know, a couple years ago and now it's an app. And it it, it it's kind of his world um, and all of those you know connections he's had over the years which are kind of insane. And and you kind of just it just it takes the gamification in a weird way because it kind of steers you. But it's his brand. But in the end, it's CNN. I mean, you wouldn't get here if it wasn't for right. CNN. All those connections and interviews wouldn't be there. I mean, all that infrastructure is CNN. But it's, it's his brand. I'm wondering for those of you that you know, have books or have um, TV shows or have you know, uh, career specialists that are you know, world class or whatever, how much do you view that brand versus your overall kind of platform? Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. yeah. You're the most well established brand, brand here, I mean, so you gotta start um, <laughs> This is gonna sound like I'm not answering your question, but the, our brand is obviously paramount to how the, our audience searches for us or looks for us. However, platforms like YouTube and um, uh, Kindle Free Time, as platforms, those are attracting audiences that we wouldn't have attracted. We know that we are picking up extra people, consumers, through their platform slash brand. Mm -hmm. They want our brand to help attract a wide audience. So Sesame Street isn't bringing Kindle free time all these people, but it's bringing some of them. But more what it's doing is being for Amazon to be able to say we have I'm making this up, 500 brands that are part of Kindle Free Time join us rather than some other subscription curated service. And the benefit to us is we know that we are getting new people from that. I'm sorry if that's half an answer. But. Yeah. Smart is, is so new. I think you know, we're starting to see like you know fans develop. I guess just one example, a little anecdote. We pushed a new release a feature that included some aggregated content in local news channels, so you can get like New York news. Um, and we put the app description up before the feature was actually available. And people were like, "What the hell? Where's the local channels?" You know, because we sort of, you know, we're still working on something on the back end. So we had people that are like watching what we're doing, and and we're vocal about like, "Hey, this this thing you put up, you changed your app description, but like the feature's not there yet. Where is it?" So. I, don't know, I thought that was really interesting. And then you know, in terms of like developing our brand, I mean, it's kind of a little bit, I get too far off, off topic here, but we have a cartoon character. It's a very Japanese thing in, in Japan. His name's Chikunkun, and the translation is like Mr. World. It's like a cartoon character that illustrates things that are going on in the news that day. Um, so it's a brand development thing. He's got his own Twitter account. He's, he's very popular there. So I just really wanted to bring it up. So I was thinking maybe we could get him a spot on Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> we're, huge, we're huge in Japan, in Japan with tweens. So we're probably over by a little bit, but are there any other questions out there that we want to hit these panelists with? We're good. All right, well, you know, let's uh, thank you guys for braving the elements and uh, thank, thank the panelists for showing up and a very good conversation. Thanks so much.